morning. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this uh, first uh, session of the Indica Books Writers Workshop with Otis. Uh, for those of you joining in for the first time, this is uh, a service provided by Indica Books and Indica to aspiring writers and authors who want to get uh, feedback on the writing from Otis. And uh, what we do is uh, you send in your piece uh, uh, well in advance and Otis reviews it, marks it up with his feedback, sends it back to you as a PDF. I mean, you send it as a PDF, he marks it up with his uh, notes and comments and sends it back to you. And then when we meet on Sundays, typically at uh, 8.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time, we go over those pieces. Uh, you can go ahead and ask your questions, clarify your doubts, or in general, uh, you know, engage with him in, uh, in, in, in some of his feedback and all. And we use this essentially to learn from each other's pieces, as well as uh, uh, it provides also an opportunity, a forum for people to, to uh, you know, to learn from each other. As I just said, uh, you can you can go to the our Indica Books Twitter handle at uh, twitter.com/indicabooks to know more about Indica Books as well as on how to submit your pieces. You can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash group slash Indic Book Club. And you will find about 60 sessions that we have conducted so far as part of this Open House Writers Workshop on YouTube. Uh, with that, I will turn this over to you, Otis. OK, thank you. Um, well, welcome back. 2023, so far so good. Um, Nice to see you all. Uh, yeah, let's, uh, Sweta, uh, let's let's start with your piece. Um, I will share my screen and maybe you can tell us a little bit about it and then we will read um, maybe the first. So actually um, this uh, I had uh, written uh, not recently, but two years ago. So it was basically before I started your sessions. But the reason I sent it suddenly was because I had tonsillitis and I was very sick and uh, I was not able to work on the other piece. So I thought, let me just at least get the ball rolling. So I took this old piece and I thought, let me just modify it a little bit and I just sent it. But this was before I attended your session. So none of that antagonist uh, part... Uh, and in fact, I was recently reading, uh, I mean, I, I went back to reading fiction and uh, I realized that without the antagonist, it's not possible to have uh, writing. So I, I, I do understand that now, uh, but this was written two years ago, actually. So it, ah. it didn't have, that's why it doesn't incorporate any of your feedback. Okay. Well, well, what, well, Swata, <laughs> I think then what, what's going to, what will happen then is that we're going to use your piece as sort of like a like a sacrifice. The sacrifice will will read a little bit of it, and, <laughs> and we'll we'll talk about it to to make to just make a couple points, and they are points that that we've made before. But um, it makes a point about voice, and uh, we'll. We'll just make those points and then and then we'll move on. We'll use it as an example then for all of us to uh, learn from. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> good. And, and it's good. It's good for us. Um, when I uh, when I first when I decided to pursue writing seriously, mm -hmm. I took a workshop to see if I could even stand it, <laughs> see if I could even stand having anyone talk about my work. And what I discovered was, no, <laughs> no, I couldn't, I couldn't. Like, um, it, it, it hurt me so much that it made me, it forced me to change. <laughs> And that's that was the beginning for me. So like I think that there might be something something like that for all of us. You know, like if we can if we can just write our work and then have people go da da da, you know, and pick it apart and we feel fine with it, then I don't think we're gonna exactly do the work of the workshop, right? You know, because we're just oh well, we're fine with it. Instead, when it hurts, we change. Um, let me share this a little bit. Let me see. Where's my sharing thing? 
Um, okay, so this was a piece. Oh, there's... You see my screen? This is something I've noticed. Yes. You do. Um, I have a little, some kind of little glitch. I'm gonna, I guess, sorry, I have to stop the show. So, oh boy. Um, do you hear me? Yes. Okay. Where did you all go? No, I'm kidding. Oh. It was my problem. My, my, my computer, my, my computer uh, crashed. Okay. So let's try this again. Hopefully this will work. Uh, so I'm going to go like this. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't know what's happening here. Notability. Yeah. Okay. Did that work? Yeah, I can see uh, the piece now. Okay. Um. So, uh, Swetha, um, can you can you um? Just uh, read the beginning of uh, this piece. Let's see. Um, yeah, so this like, is page. So like the city exists, it ceases to make any movement. It is midnight. I am excited. We vampires are always excited at this hour. Moment by moment, I study the cityscape and go back to my paintings. Something is ceasing to make sense. Something today. I wish I could be like a bubble wrap painting, all fresh and ready to be seen, but I'm jaded, sentient, but also not human. The future city of seem dream, like a poem undone. Here shines the manuscript lessons, and here with is a sudden flash, lightning that lights the way. Here is a summer flavor. What we eat at breakfast, a garlic sandwiches, no wishes for us. Here is a watershed camp. We are nonetheless a foregone conclusion. What difference does the Paratha point make? We are vampires. My name is Van Stand. Someone came to me asking about the past, so automatically I wanted to talk about the future. The future of being, the future of seeing, the future of living, the future of... Yeah, great, thank you. It goes on. Um, <laughs> the future of dying. I live in Cambodia. I like this. I love, there's some great lines in here. I, I love, you know, what you, you know, I do think when we, this is going to be a conversation about voice, basically, right, because all of this is basic, uh, the, this piece 
is all in voice, we don't really have tangible characters who are doing things. So the comments today are going to be about voice. Uh, voice is a great thing. I have found in my experience that it can be uh, intoxicating, you know, to to uh, adopt a voice. Um, I I remember, you know, when I was a kid, I used to adopt sort of accents and voices, and somehow voices would free my subconscious in a way. My my conscious sort of verbal mind with my own language was very constricted. But when I used voices, I suddenly was able to access all sorts of different material that I wouldn't even know kind of even where it came from. It was sort of, uh, I don't know, it was kind of magical, actually, you know, in its way. And that can still happen to me. Absolutely. So there's a kind of intoxicating quality, I think, to writing with a voice. And I think that having a voice can be very, um, very interesting for us. I don't know, is there a word exploratorily? That doesn't sound right, but you know, it's a it's something we can use to explore. The trouble with voice is that it's, and what I want to say, like, I want to say it's abstract, but it's not 100% abstract. It's a real thing. Like when I talk, something real is happening, right? But it's just, there's nothing there. You know, it's uh, sound waves. And I think that that's true of voice on the page too. It's just in a sense, sound waves. It's nothing that the reader can see. Um, and not only just see, but but basically engage all of their sort of imaginative sensory experience. Because I think that that's what the reader does when we read, we look at words and we interpret it through our sort of sensory brain. So when we just write in voice, there's nothing for us to, the five senses, right? There's nothing for us to see. There is something for us to hear, but there's nothing for us to smell, you know, a touch, taste, right? All of those senses are gone and we just hear. I think it's, I don't know, I have a problem with being maybe too mathematical, but like when we write, we want to engage the reader with five senses. Like we don't want to just use one tool when we can use five tools to grab that reader. We want to use all of those sensory uh, sensations. And to do that, we basically put characters on the page who are doing things. And I think we know this to be pretty true. We want to use, you know, telling detail, as they say. We want to have specific detail that basically focuses the reader's attention on things. And we use that as a kind of focus point. You know, uh, <laughs> we walk into the room, two people are standing there, they're arguing, right? And then the camera seems to focus on this vase, you know, and the and the and the, the viewer is going, oh no. And then one of them picks up the vase and hits the other person with it, right? So we 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 manipulate our reader with language that represents certain kinds of specific things. Um and Really, that's the comment on the piece, you know, so, you know, we, we have this kind of, we have this voice, the voice is very intriguing, as intriguing as it can be, it still is not going to evoke as much imaginative experience in the reader as using those other four sensory experiences. And in fact, here too, because it's a voice without a person behind it, it's not even dialogue in a sense, we don't have a person talking to another person which could be an action that the reader is perceiving between two sort of concrete characters on the page. Since it's not even that, it's more abstracted than dialogue. Dialogue is more concrete than simply voice. So that is, um, 
that's the comment. That's uh, does that make a little bit of sense? I think it's making a lot of sense because uh, but because actually I was not I think there was there was a fundamental uh, problem with the way I was writing so I obviously this was something I wrote two years ago so I had not factored in any of the feedback so but this is how uh, writing was coming to me naturally so I need to curtail it and uh, sort of ensure that it goes in a direction where it makes sense to the audience because I it's not just about writing for myself but for it to be read and it to make sense. So definitely the feedback is very relevant and useful. Right. I mean, that's that's one of the things that we, I think, one of the first things we have to kind of deal with. I think when we come to writing, we come to writing wanting to express ourselves. And so we're thinking about, well, it's not exactly thinking about us, but we're trying to access us. We're trying to access our voice. Yeah. But the written document is a bridge between the consciousness of the writer and the consciousness of the reader. It's a bridge. And so we have to use, we have to make that bridge out of something that's, I'm sorry, I'm like, I'm going with my analogy here, but we have to go with something concrete or else the reader is trying to cross the bridge to you, but they can't, there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. they, things too, things that they can understand. They need, you know, concrete and they need steel and they need, you know, cables holding it so that they can get across to you. And you need also concrete, cables, steel, so you can get across to them. Yeah. Wow. We're just going to, we're just going to let that one stay there. But I think that idea of a bridge, it is, but it's actually... You know, I've thought a lot about it. You know, it's it's a complex issue for us writers because we have a strong desire to express something from us. And it can be very difficult to do the things necessary for that pesky reader on the other side who's making demands with their <laughs> consciousness, right? We want to represent our consciousness, which has no bounds, but we have mm -hmm. to work with the, not the, not just the reader's consciousness, we have to work with the human consciousness to create mm -hmm. that bridge. Mm -hmm. And then inevitably someone is going to say, if I, if I give this speech, someone is gonna say, well, what about notes from the underground? Mm -hmm. So, and then I'm gonna go, well, that was Dostoevsky. And that, that story is in two parts, actually. One is completely in voice, and the other is a story that's concrete. So, and it was written in the 1800s. So, you know. But yeah, that is, uh, it's, a, it's a great thing. It's a, it's a great thing to learn and think about and conceptualize. I think that idea, if everyone can get it in their mind, please do not write with just one sense. Mm -hmm. Where most writers go wrong is they just write with sight. Like even if they do get into characters, they're only dealing with sight and they're giving up four other sensory experiences. Mm -hmm. We want to use sensory language to evoke all of the senses of our reader imaginatively because that's going to be more effective and draw them into our world than just using one. Um, do you know that... So there's some great examples when we talk about sort of using sensory experience. Do you know that novel, the French novel, Par Perfume is the way it's translated, Parfum. Do you know that novel? It's, uh, it's, it's worth reading because it's about someone with like an exaggerated olfactory sense. And so the language in it leans very heavily to smells. So really the writer is giving themselves a task to write all of these smells and really lean on that. He's, the writer is still using these other sensory experiences too, of course, seeing things and touching things, but that, that sense of smell is really exaggerated. Um, I'm not gonna have it here, I don't think. 
there's a there's another there's another group of short stories by a writer named Anthony Dorr called The Shell Collector. And in that title story, which I think was, I'm not sure, it was either in the Atlantic or maybe in New Yorker or something like that. It was a fantastic story. But the, the main character is blind, living on an island, and um, basically works with this uh, cone snail that you might be familiar with. It has a very toxic poison. So because the character is blind, it's the story uses all, and that's the point of view character. The point of view character is blind. So we're not using sight. He didn't see things very often. He hears them. He hears a boat, the motor chugging in the water, right? Mm -hmm. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a tour de force of sort of using sensory experiences. And that, that's like one of those situations where the writer, and I think writers do this, they take on challenges, and Anthony Doerr is definitely that kind of writer. He's taking on the challenge of removing something that's, you know, like a like a crutch to him using sight, and then exploring his ability to use this other, you know, these other sensory experiences to fill the gap, essentially. Um, that story is incredible for two reasons, right? So it has a sensory experience that's going to be a lot of hearing, right? But also a lot of touch, taste, and all the rest of the sensory experiences. But also it has the specificity of that little snail that can cause death, right? So like that that sense of focusing on this little thing that he would reach down and pick up and feel the shell, the swirls, however you describe all of these things. And then take it back to his um, hut, put it into his jar, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's great to great for all of us to look for sort of applications of some of these principles that we talk about here and then see how writers are doing it. And then as you said in the beginning, Sweta, um, this is this you wrote this before you've attended these. And yeah, we don't have that sense of conflict. So mm -hmm. that's another important element in our storytelling because it attracts the reader's attention. Because when they see conflict, it becomes something that's relevant to themselves and their own survival struggle. They see that there's like, you know, it's it's something to grapple with more so than you know, let's say um, a painting that's like a still life, mm -hmm. right? And so, and what, and so, what you end up having in this piece is sort of like a still life of voice. So that's two things that are not really going to engage the reader. Okay. Thank you. Sure, of course. What do you think, Abhinav? Does that make any sense? What's your What's your experience with voice? Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know what it is. It's a uh, It's a difficult one. Uh, I struggle with it. Yeah. And uh, so, I mean, my. When writing short pieces versus writing more of a full length book, for example, I think uh, 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 it takes time for the voice to emerge in the longer pieces. But I think once it does, it carries more uh, strength of conviction than it does with short pieces. With short pieces, I think to, at least my challenge is that uh, uh, if not if not done properly, it can sometimes feel forced. Mm -hmm. Well, another another way to think about voice too is that you know we we would pretty much only have a, narr a a narrator a narrator's voice if we have a first person narrator. I feel like if we don't have a first person narrator, if we have then we have a different kind of voice, and I think writers do have a kind of voice with their limited omniscient narrators in their stories, 
because they have, but then I think we call that almost writing style because mm -hmm. it doesn't really belong to a person. It has to, it seems to me, it has to belong to a person to be a voice. This piece here, there is a first person narrator, so it's their voice. Having the characters in the story and a, and a first person narrator is a character in the story, I, I feel, um, having a particular voice is important because you want all of your characters to have distinct voices. So it's complicated a little bit. I mean, and that's, so, and that's really true. Like, you know, I've found in a lot of things that I that I read, particularly at sort of like the, you know, the aspirant level, right? The, the characters, sometimes you get all the characters, they sound exactly the same. But none of us sound exactly the same, right? So we want to be able to, as writers, we want to be able to write the particular voices. We want to be able to hear people's particular voices and reproduce some kind of unique voice with all of our characters. We want to have a unique voice with our uh, narrator if, in their, if they're in first person. I would argue for the most part that if we have omniscience, we do not want to have the bias of uh, voice involved. We don't want to have the personality of voice, but we would have something that's still called style. Yeah, that. so I had two questions, and I think you kind of uh, addressed the first one that I was going to ask, which is that in, in a writing which has got both uh, an omniscient narrator who has a point, of, who has a style uh, in a particular point of view, and you also have characters with their own individual point points of view and a style. Uh, how do you how do you imbue the omniscient narrator with a style that does not sort of intrude, uh, but yet is is it is individual and distinct in its own right? Right. Well, I think I think the 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 base for that omniscient narrator, I feel is that they should not have bias. They should not express any bias. If they express bias, then they become a personality. If they what become, about if they're, the let me just finish this up and up. If they become a personality, then they intrude and they, and they, and they, and they damage our, the reader's attention to the story because Only people have bias, right? You know, people have biases, and now we have an omniscient narrator with bias. That means that that, that omniscient narrator is not an omniscient narrator that, that without personality. They are a person that exists. And now the reader is wondering, well, when is the other shoe going to drop? When is this character going to be in the story? Right. And and that's that's what we have in personal essay. Personal essay has an often a, even a, um, an omniscient narrator who has a bias and we also and we also have it in nonfiction and a lot of other places where you actually have a writer who's writing something seemingly from an omniscient standpoint but they're actually expressing a bias so that's yeah, it, it it starts to get a little complicated. But anyway, I cut you off, Abhinav. What were you going to say? No, no, no. Uh, that's, uh, that's a good point. And my question was that, uh, so on the one hand, you have, you know, this injunction against uh, the omniscient narrator exp expressing a bias because, uh, you know, not supposed to do that. On the other hand, what if uh, the narrator has a certain style, whether it is... Uh, that of uh, uh, you know uh, sort of a paternal sort of a you know voice uh, cynics voice uh, you know a crustacean old uh, you know old fellow's voice it's not expressing bias but it still has a style so it would end up intruding on the the narrative itself, the narration itself. People start to associate human qualities with that style, and they start saying that, okay, is this person going to reveal himself or herself them, themselves at some point? On the, and on the third hand, if one can imagine a person with three hands, on the third hand, 
you also <laughs> have this problem that if you don't have any of these okay bias i can understand it's 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 sort of i think a no no uh, especially in in either fiction or non fiction so let's leave that aside then you have this question of style and the third one is that if uh, you don't have a particular style then how do you end up with writing that is still going to engage especially where you have the omniscient narrator advancing the story without having it seem like uh, you know cut and dry prose i think that's where the my question was right and uh this is <laughs> that's a that's a complicated question too I think that that's something that we we develop and it can be it can be difficult because what we do as writers is that in a sense we're actors right because we have to fill with life every single character that we write we have to give them an individual voice we have to give them an individual motivation we have to you know play out the scenes by playing out this person they might be our point of view character that we're most focused on that we're most um involved with and 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 reaching most deeply but we also have to animate all the other characters in our story so we have to be capable of going into their experience understanding their motivation understanding their character so we're a writer who can ideally developed a capacity to understand all of these individual lives that is a technique right like an actor so you could i could be the actor and you could ask me to play this part and i can play it you can ask me to play this part and i can play it right so now i have an ability to play a lot of different parts the question is then who am i right what is my voice and that's what you end up having let's say in a work of fiction right um let's think of an extreme example leo tolstoy right leo tolstoy war and peace is the book i know a little bit better than anna karenina but you know he's he has let's say 20 major characters in there right so he's able to understand all of those characters possess them in that in that case of war and peace he was not he didn't feel restricted by you know multiple points of view he went into multiple points of view he was omniscient so what is his voice what is leo tolstoy's voice um it can it can be hard to develop that and and it, and because we're so uh, i'm going to <laughs> because the writer is so protean right because we're so able to adopt all these other characters because we're basically a kind of shapeshifter it is difficult to figure out well what is our true authentic voice also and that's where they talk about authenticity right do we develop authenticity it's um i think it's another one of these things that's a life's work um yeah Yeah, I I had one more question, but I honestly can't think what it was. Maybe it'll come back to me. But uh, yeah, thanks for thanks for that uh, first part, uh, Otis. Yeah, and thank you, uh, Swetha, for for submitting that piece. It allows us to have this pretty intense conversation. I think that you know that I don't think there's really answers for this, but I know for me, I thought a lot about it. Right, you know, like having a voice, you know, like if you read Raymond Carver, um, if you read Hemingway, if you read, you know, a number of authors, I mean, I'm sure you can name, you know, many, and you think of them as having distinctive voices, regardless of who, who or what they're writing about. Mm -hmm. We want to keep that in mind for all of us. I think that the for me, probably the thing that drives is authenticity, mm -hmm. right? And the, and the way that we reach authenticity is we seek to write the truth. 
And it seems to me, and I think that that's the voice that I aspire to, to write truth. Hemingway said, you know, our, our aspiration as a writer is to write one true sentence. So I think that that's a good one, you know, to, to drive ourselves to write the truth, not to write our personal bias, which is something that we, we begin to understand if we're serious writers, because we go into all of these different characters, we realize that all of those characters have a bias, right? That's developed out of their life experience. And so that makes us question in a sense, the, even the idea of bias for ourselves as a writer. And then we become, we become a person who is not trying to write our personal bias, which is a kind of lie that's based on our lives, but instead we try to witness, we try to become a witness. I think that's the way I tend to describe it for myself. I want to be a witness of life. I don't want to be um, a spin doctor of life. Um, well, cool. That's uh, voice is a, it's a big deal. In the meantime, we can put that kind of high pollutant conversation to the side and we can come up with the very nuts and bolts, you know, directive for all of us to write with sensory information, sensory information, sight, uh, smell, touch, taste, hearing, um, when I think of sensory information, I also think about uh, the the intimacy of sensual inf uh, of sensual information, with sight being the most objective, right? That's kind of objectifying. Hearing is more intimate because we don't really have a choice over what we hear. Um, <laughs> I don't have it exact. I don't have it exactly worked out here, but like, let's say. Um, what do we say? Smell is even more intimate, right? Um, touch, maybe more intimate still. And then of course, taste, probably the most intimate, right? And, and if we look at those senses too, we, we, we can almost imagine how we can write sensory information to take us into an interiority of experience for our character. I think that's a, you know, that's a high level. And I'll use that. I'll have a character who sees something, hears something, or actually maybe I'll have them hear it first because it's like, what? Right? They'll hear, they'll see, they'll um, smell, they'll touch, they'll taste. That brings us into a greater interiority of experience. And then I'll take the, I'll take the reader out of that experience in the opposite way also. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, Abhinav. Let's talk about your work. Pranshu, um, I'm not sure that you were here a moment ago, but um, I uh, mentioned to Abhinav that, that there were some similarities um, in your work, and uh, we'll see how this goes. Yeah, I don't think uh, Pranshu was there when you said that he joined a few minutes after that, I think. Okay. So... Yeah, that the, the that one actually. Uh, so this I wrote like. Oh, this is a different. Okay. This. Yeah, we're we're gonna do Abhinav's first, Pranshu. Um, but but I was just saying that there's gonna be a, a kind of a similar, uh, similar discussion for for. Yeah, but in in my work, I I will tell you, it is an omniscient narrator who is biased. <laughs> <laughs> and well, and uh, yeah, and actually, sort of uh, placed outside sort of the time and space. Like like Krishna is giving a TED talk, so that was my. But uh, anyway, let's look at this one and then I'll. Okay, Krishna giving a TED talk. Well, if you titled it like that, then we would then yeah, we really. So, no, yeah, actually, I, so, so that's I think I think I, I edited it down. So that's where the problem is. I think what I do is I know a lot of about the information. So I when I'm editing it out, I take out the explanatory parts. And I think that sort of uh, makes it a little, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it removes from the reader the, you know, the information about the thing. It was becoming quite big. If you know, I noticed, I think it was about 1800 words already. So mm -hmm. I mean, it was like much longer. So I had 
trimmed it down and I, I should have kept that original idea in. Anyway, let's start this, yeah. No, no, no worries, we'll, we'll get to it in a minute. And I do know that you have a first person narrator there. I noticed, I noticed the first person narrator. And, and in Abhinav's piece, we don't have that. But um, Abhinav, why don't you tell us a little bit about this piece and then maybe read this opening. So uh, a few weeks back sometime, I think uh, in December, I'd shared a piece uh, uh, along the same lines where uh, uh, this guy, Jen Jay is asking, he asks uh, the sage, Vesham Pine, about the origins of his, uh, of his lineage. And uh, he starts to talk about a character named Shakuntala and, and all. So this is sort of a continuation of that. If you move down the Mahabharata a few chapters, uh, uh, you get to this uh, point where uh, essentially, you know, Janvajay is asking why are his descendants called the Purus? Uh, and uh, the sage tells him that that's because, uh, you know, you're descended from, uh, from, from uh, you know, long, long back, uh, you had a king named Puru and he was a successor of uh, his father, Yayati. And that's why you're called, uh, you know, Purus or Pauravs. But also, he was not the eldest son, yet he became the king. Uh, he was the fifth in line, actually, the fifth youngest among, you know, the youngest among five sons. And uh, yet he became the king. And that's because his father, Yayati, had cursed all four of them to never become kings. And, and you know, slight variations of curses pronounced on all four. And... This is where the story starts. Uh, uh, it's a continuation. So uh, some of the context or the sub, you know, the introductory pieces to, to frame the story in its proper context would already have been uh, covered earlier as to, you know, why the story is being told, who's telling it, who's listening to it, why is this person listening to the story and so, some of those things. I, which is why I, you know, taking a chance that, it may affect the 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 you know the readability or the uh, you know the comprehensibility of the story uh, for someone reading it uh, standalone. I uh, sent it off. Okay. Well, good. Well, um, everything you know. I think the, you know the purpose of the workshop is you know for us to try things and then learn from it but you know at the end of the day you know it's it's really for everyone here to take away what they want to and use what they want to to produce the work that they want to right so like i mean we're we tend to talk about you know i think that what with sweta we were talking about you know the the writer and the reader and creating this bridge right um and what is the quality of that bridge going to be kind of that's one of the things that we might say that we're talking about here. Um, why don't you, uh, Abhinav, why don't you read this first, this first section for us? Okay. Uh, so this is the title, The Age of Desire, The Roots of a Curse. It's uh, for those of you who know the Mahabharata, this is uh, basically the story of Yayati. Uh, it's, so Vaishampayan, the sage, told Janmajay the king that one of his ancestors was a king named Yayati. His father-in-law had cursed him. Consequently, Yayati had lost his youth, turning from a young, handsome king into a bent, wrinkled old geezer. Yayati went in desperation to all his five sons, requesting them to exchange his decrepitude for their youth. All refused except one. Yayati cursed all except one. O sage, who was Sharmishtha? asked Janmajay. She was Vrishpal's daughter, replied Vaishampayan. Who was Vrishpal? He was a king of the Asurs, the demons. Oh, sage, what is it am I hearing? Am I an Asur because I am Vrishpal's descendant? Asked the aghast Janmajay. Well, are you an Aditya, a celestial being, because you are descended from the sun god? Answered the sage by way of a question. I am a Suryavan sheep because I am Vivas, uh, Vivas What's a descendant, proffered Janmajay? Well, you certainly are a human, a Manav, because you have descended from Manu. Humans were called Manavs because they all descended from Manu. And I think that will do for now, Vaishampayan said. Yes, that will do for now, I think, Janmajay fell silent. But why did Yayati's youngest son get to be heir and not any other of Yayati's other sons? He asked after a moment. 
Yes, why Puru and why not his elder siblings? Listen on, said Vaishampayan. Okay. Uh, till uh, this point? Uh, yeah, that's great. Um, so before sorry. anything, I have to say one, one, one thing. As I was reading this aloud, I noticed some uh, unevenness in the first bits that I think I'll have to go back and rewrite. It, it just didn't seem to flow well. So, mm -hmm. yeah, with that, I'll, yeah, I'll. Uh, you didn't name Shamishta immediately. See, that's something that was. Exactly. One, one of those things. And even the first paragraph, it was very, very confusing as to who was the king, who was cursed, who was, uh, and, and, who was and so on. Yeah. So Puru and Shamishta didn't, doesn't get introduced. I think that one. Okay, I thought I had, I thought I had it there. Thank. Okay. Okay. Well, let's, 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 uh, let's, uh, I'll, I'll break in here. Um, so. One of the things I was thinking about in this piece, and you see, I come up at, at the end. I actually just recently said this. And it was something I just, yeah, I was working with someone with someone's work, and uh, I've said different things about dialogue. You know, I I quote uh, David Mamet. His he has the analysis. Characters don't always say that what they mean, but they always say something to get them what they want, which is not really a comment on the dialogue itself. It's, uh, I mean, in a way it is, it's saying that our dialogue should always have a subtext that uh, represents the character so that the character has a motivation and they're basically represented by that motivation in everything they say. I think that that's a true observation. The, the way it's said sounds a little bit negative about characters, but I, but I think that there's a positive way to think about it. Every character has a kind of life force. Every character is trying to do something and they're motivated to do something in every moment, in every gesture and in every thought. They're, they are basically exhibiting this sort of this desire and, and life force. And so that should be represented in everything that they do and say, because saying is an action. And according to me anyway, thinking is also an action. So. Everything that a character thinks is motivated, everything a character says, and everything they do is motivated by them, you know. So that's one thing. David Mamet, we'll put David Mamet over here. Um, I've told you the story about John LaRue many times, who was a professor of mine when I was at Stanford, and a wonderful, a wonderful man. He was uh, acerbic and, and difficult and could cut you to the quick like nobody's business. He wrote like 12 novels. I said, John, tell me something I can really use. And one of the things he told me was uh, dialogue is what characters do to each other. Okay, good too, but also maybe reflects a little bit of John LaRue's negative, cynical life, <laughs> life uh, um, perspectives. Okay, fine, great. I have now, <laughs> I'm now coining, and I'm sure someone has said this before, the dialogue is a dance. So it's characters. And if you need, if you need to understand how it's a dance, please watch some clips of the tango. So we have two characters, they're interacting with each other. They the the focus in our dialogue, we are we are setting a stage. We have a frame of the curtains on the side. We're putting two characters in the middle the story, then we are telling the reader the story is about them. That's the mm -hmm. modern way that we basically tell stories. So we don't tell stories in, in the modern frame. We don't have, um, what is it, the Greek chorus. <laughs> you know, the, in, the Greek, in Greek drama, they have the chorus who explains stuff to you, right? Um, there's basically, so it splits the sort of the Greek drama into two sides. There's this chorus that does a lot of explaining, and then there's some dramatic action that's in the center, right? Uh, our modern standard is really to simply forego the explanation and highlight the drama. The, I don't know, but I was going to say the reason for that is that, you know, in our modern life, we just don't have time. So 
Anyway, so I want to offer for one this idea of the dialogue being a dance. When I think of the dialogue being a dance, I don't see these two characters dancing. Hmm. I see them. I don't see the story even being about them. The story seems to be about something else that's not on the stage. Good. It reminds it, it reminds me a little bit uh Abhinav, of like you know when you're when you're going to the uh, Mahabharata as a source, that is, I, I mean, I don't know, I wasn't there, but it seems to me that that and like, you know, the the Torah that became the Old Testament and you know these things, the the older stories, right? So not the New Testament that was actually written when there was writing, but those older stories come from an oral tradition where a history and a lineage and um, you know the reasons about why things are this way or that way, those things were passed down by storytellers through the generations. And, and here we're talking maybe many, many generations before it was ever even written down in Sanskrit or some of the earliest languages, cuneiform, Sanskrit and cuneiform being, you know, I, I don't know exactly, I'm not an expert, but maybe the two earliest languages, right? Um, Correct. I mean, in, 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 you know, Sanskrit also, like any other language, underwent transformations, but uh, the earliest forms of Sanskrit can be traced back to four or 5,000 years, if not more. Right, right. And cuneiform is right in that period, too. You mean Sumerian? So, uh, I mean, cuneiform is a script. Sumerian would be the language. Okay. What's the uh, Sanskrit? What's the script called in Sanskrit? Devanagari. Well, it has gone through many scripts, Brahmi initially, and then Devanagari, and before that, you know, even <clears> unknown <throat> scripts in between. But the yeah, the scripts are basically current script is Devanagari, and the before that it was Brahmi. Okay. The point I'm trying to make, though, is that so in the oral tradition, the oral storytelling was a way to preserve information, lineage, and knowledge that got passed down. How do you do things? Why are things the way they are? Um, who, you know, in the in the Old Testament of the Bible, there's a Right after Genesis, which was so my understanding of Genesis was written something like, you know, 100 BCE. So that's recent. Writing existed at that time, but it was drawing upon older stories, but it was written down 100 BCE. The section after that, in then the, the Torah, I, I believe, right? Is a is is a lineage thing. So and so begets so and so begets so and so begets so and so. It's like the kings, you know, all the lineage of the kings that brings us down to some present day. That is a way to remember. My point is that those oral stories served a purpose of recording knowledge, how to do things. Sometimes, how do you make a, you know, how do you make a bronze sword, and who beget who, et cetera, et cetera. Then it transitioned to writing, and people wrote those stories down. Once we're able to write those things down, we don't have the need to tell the stories over and over again in order to remember them. Right. So, so what so what happened, it seems to me, and listen, I'm talking large here, like I actually know something. Who knows if I do or not? But what happened then was that the story from that time, 5,000 years ago, towards the present, those those stories were written down. They became, you know, sacred texts for people, and um, they influenced the lives, obviously, of people. But storytelling changed somewhat. Over time, storytelling became this thing where they were more concerned about the drama 
of the moment than recording the history that was already known. Correct. Where we where we arrive today, and so this is sort of like this is this was my thinking. You know, this is this is the thing I'm confronting you with, Abhinav, right? And Branchu, I'm going to confront you with this also. Um, so like, I kind of come here, and I'm like a preacher <laughs> for the modern story, you know, and. And we could we could argue whether the modern story is a good thing to do or not a good thing to do. We can make our choices. We can say, you know what? So there is modernism. There was the birth of the novel. You know, they you know in the 19th century, um, the development of the short story form with the moderns in the 1920s, post World War One, and then we enter into a postmodern period after World War Two, right? And and now we're in a kind of mishmash of sometimes people are writing metafiction, sometimes they're writing postmodern fiction, sometimes they're writing modern, right? Um, and maybe they're experimenting with other forms and they're using other mediums and technologies, but all to tell stories. What I'm kind of teaching, I guess, is the thing, you know, the way I learned, right? So I... I didn't learn my storytelling from, you know, Bible stories. I know the Bible stories, right? But I learned my storytelling from reading the Norton Anthology of short fiction, right? So I have it here somewhere. Da, 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 da. Please come jump to me, jump to me, Norton Anthology. Oh, well, I must have it in the house. So. I, I learned about short story writing from reading the Norton Anthology of Short Fiction, and then I took workshops and, you know, other things to hone my craft and learn more, and I really wanted to be a writer because I wanted everyone to adore me, and uh, then you end up, whatever, wherever you end up. So, I'm really trying to teach the modern story. The modern story focuses our attention on a, on a conflict and a struggle. It uses point of view. It begins in media race. There's a dramatic conflict that we basically focus on in the story with a protagonist and an antagonist. Part of this, part of the reason I believe we come to this kind of structure is because we just don't have time. You know, in the modern, in the modern world, in the modern life, we just don't have time. We're we're a long ways away from the storytelling of you know prehistory when you know in the winter time you know that you couldn't sow you you stored your food it got dark early and then you just you huddled around and you shared the stories that are that are your lore and your knowledge and your wisdom and all of that you shared all those things. Today, we work too much, we play too much, we, you know, we, we have all these things, and so we really cut to the chase, right? And we basically focus in on a character, we uh, explore their, what we call a character arc, so, I'm, so rather than this large history, we're just focusing on this little thing, we have a character arc, and that means that they move from one place they have an experience, and that experience changes them at the end. And we draw the reader into that experience, and the reader learns something about their life from it. All of this is a speech to say, that's what I think the short story is. Um, I, that's what I think the story is, the modern story is, something like that, whether it's modern or postmodern, et cetera, it still sort of focuses our attention. And the question is, in a way, I put to you, Abhinav, do you want to write that story? Um, and Branchu, I'll put it to you too. Do you want to write that story? Or is there something? And so, or do you want to do something else? I mean, this is something to like, you know, focus in on yourself. 
to say, what is it that I want to do? What am I trying to, what, what is my objective? And, and then how do I do it? You know, what is my strategy for doing it? I mean, I think our strategy is mainly to connect with a reader. And I, and, and I guess I'm making the argument that the modern reader has an expectation for the modern story. Yeah. You know. Correct. Uh, that I think the third point that you raised, Otis, is uh, you know, is actually the crux, the crux of the issue, uh, because number one, yes, uh, the desire is to tell or retell a story. Uh, the second one is also true that the desire is also to tell a story in an idiom that appeals to the modern reader. What is throwing a spanner in the works or a monkey wrench in the works is that uh, there are several ways of uh, telling or retelling a story for the modern audience. And many of those, uh, uh, some, many of, uh, uh, many authors have already tried that. And uh, uh, with some of them with great commercial success, but at the cost of, for lack of a better word, it's basically been an exercise in desecration. Hmm. Okay. Because the Mahabharata is not just a, a fictional telling. Say, for example, if I were to look at the Panchatantra, that's not a religious text as such. So I have, uh, I feel I have much greater liberty in interpreting it and, and, and deciding how to retell that, those stories. The Mahabharata is yes, it's it's uh, it's part history, it's part uh, uh, religious text, it's part the uh, cultural, it, it's a whole lot of things. Part sacred, so if I, you know, yeah, and the sacred setting sort of sort of drives your style, right? You you still yeah, want right. to. So if I were to approach it from a purely commercial point of view, there are you know there are n number of ways in how to approach this, but it comes at a cost that I think I wouldn't want to to, to uh, incur. So that is essentially where the fundamental dilemma is: that how do you hold on to to the uh, you know to the to the core of the story, to the tradition, yeah. but make it accessible to the modern reader who does not feel that they are reading, uh, say, a three thousand year old text written in a hundred year old style. Okay, this is Abhinav. Uh, well, let me say first. Exercise and desecration is one of the best phrases I've heard in a long time. I love it. Okay, I love it. I love this. That is some power. I thank you for unleashing that on on me. That's awesome. Um, well, so this is okay. Great. This you have outlined something that I think is really great for us to look at because. Because I want to be able to help you do what you want to do, right? I mean, I I believe that we as writers, if we we want problems, you know, writers love problems because they love solving them somehow with their art. I mean, that's what we do. So it sounds Actually. like you're saying that there's a kind of intrinsic conflict between representing in a sense, the sanctity of the story and the modern style. That is good. I love that. I love conflict. Well, sorry. Sorry if I'm getting too excited about this, but I love conflict. Okay. That's a, that's a problem that we then have to figure out because we want to write something that's not desecrate, not, a, not an experiment in desecration. You want to write something not an experiment in desecration. So how do you do that? But then how do you also work with the modern reader who has an expectation about how they're going to be communicated with? Because the, the very frustrating thing that we've already talked about with writing is that it's not just about us. No matter what our convictions are and what we believe, unfortunately, we have this pesky reader on the other side who is, I will point out, just like us actually. So we can know this reader if we understand that they are exactly like us. We too like a modern short story. We too, and, and so let's say modern story, we too like to go to the movies. 
right? We too, I mean, the, 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 the Hollywood story is the modern story. That's, you know, this thing that we've developed out of short stories, it probably developed out of short stories with a finer, more finely tuned. That, that was a development of sort of the written word, but they've reached the apotheosis in Hollywood, right? And they've done even maybe better than that with these incredible TV shows that they put on. Breaking Bad, for example, they have the thing just wired. Um, so I think that that's a, that's a, this is a great, a, a, a great conversation for us to have. Um, I wanted to, so this might, I, I, I want to, I want to check something with you. So there's a, there's a kind of another topic that I want to talk about. So to me, what's happened in, let's say, the history of literature, going from the pre-written period, which I consider very important, but is really not discussed really at all. Right? This is one of this is one of my books on my on my shelf of my most important books. This is probably the most influential book for me that I've ever read, and I read it in college. And I've never been able to get through it again since, but I still have it. Hmm. Orality and literacy that talks about the transition between oral culture and literate culture, basically. A, a book I read in a rhetoric class. So moving from the history of storytelling, so from the oral tradition through the early part of writing when, when that oral tradition was kind of written down, right? Um, through in the Western tradition, then we go to the Middle Ages, which was a <laughs> which we, we could like to call the Dark Ages. Um, I don't I don't know what what that period was like in Indian history. I don't think it was as dark as it was in Europe, right? Then we in, in Western we have the Renaissance, etc. Stories are developing, and then we we arrive at this modern story. So those earliest stories concern themselves with uh, kings, let's say, um, gods, gods and kings. And sometimes, and in the, in the Western tradition, and you can think of how this corresponds, gods, kings, demigods, kings as demigods, etc., warriors, etc. So they are people so for this group down here, the people who listened to the stories, these stories were about people that were way up high. What has happened as the story has developed, uh, it remained this way in, in Western tradition, it remained being about kings and warriors, King Arthur, you know, through the medieval period. Um, even when you get to Shakespeare, you're still dealing with King Lear, but they're becoming more human, right? In Shakespeare, the, the kings and the warriors uh, like Macbeth or the princes like Hamlet, we're still talking about people at the very upper echelons of sort of the, the social hierarchy. Um, but they're becoming not gods anymore. They're actually human. Hamlet is the prince. He's a demigod, really but he's treated as a human being. As we move, we get closer and closer to bringing the people who we're writing about in the modern story and Chekhov, we're gonna put Chekhov right here. He's the person that really says, talking about regular people, uh, talking about what were the peasants, the people who were just listening to the stories, suddenly the peasant was the protagonist of the story. What this means, I think, for this type of material, Abhinav, is that one of the modern strategies for doing it would be to write a modern story. And, and Pranchu, um, I've, you've disappeared off my screen, but Pranchu, this also for you, one of the ways they so, would do it is they would have a protagonist that was close to the people who was associated with right with krishna 
or these kings. You know, it would be like uh, Krishna's water boy, right? Would be a would be a modern story, right? You could even see that as a title of a book. You know, um, Krishna's valet or whatever you might have it. An example of this in a slightly different form. So I'm going to go to Shakespeare now. Shakespeare becomes an icon of uh, Western literature, right? He's like the, the deity of Western literature. I want to say, is it Tom Stoppard that wrote um, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead? Do you remember that play? Does anyone know that? I think no. it might be Stoppard. So you'll see an example of that. Tom Stoppard is basically you taking this sort of lofty material of Shakespeare and recasting it in a modern style by writing about Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, who are minor characters that die. Do you see how that sort of parallels what I'm talking about? The, the subject of story were gods, kings, demigods, and then in the modern story, it, the subject of the story has become like Chekhov sets it off, the, the regular person, the peasant, the shopkeeper, you know, and, and Stoppard is giving us an example by writing about taking the icon of Shakespeare and writing about the minor characters. So it brings it closer to the audience. Right. I'm setting up yeah, a so question here. Oh, Abana, my question is, do you think that that works against your purposes? Because what I'm trying to find is a way for you to do what you want and a way to do what I want, right? I want to read the modern story. And, and so can we work together? Is that yeah, a I possibility can... or not? Well, I think the unambiguous answer is yes, The because someone with enough talent, imagination, and uh, and in possession of uh, the craft of writing can do that. The, the, I think the more fundamental question is if I can manage to find that path, right? Essentially, that's what it comes down to. And to what extent are the experimentations that will help achieve that, whether, it, uh, whether they are in, in terms of form, whether they're in terms of structure, whether they're in terms of... Uh, uh, you know, if it, if you're talking of points of view, whether it has to be an omniscient narrator, whether some of the stories need to be broken up and rewritten in a first-person point of view, because essentially one of the the the, the things also that I've uh, figured out is that it is the beginning of each story that really determines whether a reader is going to go on to the next paragraph, the next page, and so on. So that also is something that uh, maybe uh, I, I have to work out uh, during the editing phase that uh, here's the structure of the story written. Now, when I'm editing it, where, what do I cut out? What do I excise? And uh, how do I make the, the, you know, the opening more compelling and yet consistent with the, with the style? Well, let's, uh, yeah, and, and let's, I mean, just to, you know, to re-emphasize this idea, like, so again, these original stories are for people who are sitting around a fire or something, you know, out in the Great Plain, and they're listening to a captivating storyteller who has basically memorized in their sort of rhythmic poetic fashion, the epic poet poetic fashion, this great history of all the time before, right? And they share that. But Correct. And that's a very interesting point because the Mahabharata, I mean, the one that uh, that is uh, that has been passed down, is it is actually the oral retelling of uh, an oral retelling. Right. So all so already, even though the original author Vyasa wrote the uh, you know he composed the Mahabharata and then he taught it to five disciples, the first public retelling was uh, occurred you know much later. And one of the people who listened to it, he went uh, and he he went to this uh, uh, place where there were uh, there was a big collection of sages and and all, and he retold the story there. So essentially, it it 
it, I think, reiterates the point that you were ma- making, that uh, stories or texts essentially were oral to begin with. And at some point, maybe a thousand, two thousand years ago, some of them started to get, uh, uh, you know, put down on paper. But till that point, they were essentially transmitted orally. And even after the first stories were written down on palm leaf manuscripts or, or whatever, they still were spread through word of mouth. You know, you had these bards who went from place to place yeah. and retold these stories. So each each recounter essentially brought uh, their own style and a different flavor, which worked for the audience. Right. Absolutely. They became they became that's what I love about that, that the idea of the oral still oral storytelling tradition is that every time it was told this was a this was a point that I understood when I was in college that, that so blew me away was that, you know, every time that that story was told, it was true. There was nothing to refute it, right? <laughs> there's no, re- re- there's like, no, no, wait, let's look at the text and uh, let's check that out. Um, but the thing I want to, I want to draw us to a little bit is that, so this distance, this is the thing that I think is the, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated. Okay, I'm going to say it's complicated. Yes, yes. Because because look where we are now, you know, the 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 dominant experience of my daughter is basically watching movies about Marvel superheroes. How are Marvel superheroes that much different than the demigods and gods of before? So so there is a kind of there's that's retained. But I want to bring us to this point where we sort of um one of my experiences in reading the text is that I am so distant from what is the subjects. I mean, honestly, I'll tell you, I feel this way when I, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to say, if you saw the movie Lost in Translation, you know, it's, you know, these stories about super rich people who live in the high rises or or Abby Abington Gates, maybe I'm particular, but I don't care. I don't care. I, you know, I like reading stories about people who are like me that I can identify with. I cannot identify with those people very well. But this idea of identification is important. Um, I wanted to make the, I'd like to draw your attention back to uh, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. If you have not seen that, there's a movie version of it. It is excellent. But you will notice something in that it's a, it's a, it's a mind-blowing, mind-blowing uh, play. We deal with the lives of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. This other life of Hamlet is going on, but it is off stage. I think it's kind of a something to to try and take in and drink in about the the material that you're working with, that it's possible to leave. So what Stoppard does, I think it's Stoppard, what Stoppard does is he leaves the sacrosanct, uh, the, you know, Shakespeare play, he leaves it intact. He doesn't rewrite it. He doesn't change it. He doesn't make it a bunch of, you know, Leonardo DiCaprio's in, in Los Angeles. He simply, removes it, it runs exactly like it does, but he focuses the frame around these minor characters and their struggle. It's really, it's brilliant. It is something that I'm going to say is, you know, one of my requirements, kind of. It's like, if you gave me King Arthur, you know, if I'm if I'm sitting and I open up a book and I'm reading about King Arthur, and it is exactly the King Arthur of legend, that's not going to connect with me. And exactly, you know, here here I am. I don't know that I don't know this tradition, but I'm reading about kings. I'm reading about sages. I'm reading about deities, perhaps. You know, I'm reading about these characters that are very aloof from my experience. And my my demand as a modern reader is that this is relevant to me. It it is Abhinav, you can judge me if you want. 
please do. <laughs> that Otis <laughs> is so selfish and self-involved. You are right. I am. You know, I want it to be relevant to me and my life because that's why I'm going to give it my attention and read it. If it's not relevant to me in my life, I'm not because I need to take care of business, right? I need to make a living. I need to pay my mortgage. You know, I need to do these various things. So I, I only have time enough to deal with the survival issues in the modern society. And so I need something to be relevant to help me survive and negotiate my modern existence. Um, so I just want to draw your attention to that, like the, just to underscore that the choice of, of your characters who you're trying to involve me with, I'm finding a distance there that I can't, I can't step over. The other thing you can do is humanize those, those characters more so, so I can identify with them, but I can't really change. I'm not going to change. I'm speaking for myself as like the modern reader. I can't change who I am. I need that relevance. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So this is something that I'm struggling with, uh, finding, you know, trying out different things. So I think, uh, yeah, Let, let's get to the questions. Ram had a question and Shweta, you also raised your hand. Uh, I've, been, hand. I've been wanting to jump in for a very, very long time. Because well, Ram, um, that's great that's interest. Not... Yeah. Yes, yes, you're saying something, uh, Otis. No, I was just going to make a joke, but I'm going to not get in your way, Ron. Please enter the conversation. Oh, all right. Yeah. No, okay. Uh, so uh, Abhinav mentioned a very important point when he talked about the desecration of text. I think, uh, yes, uh, on the one end, we have, like you said, the text which for the current time and milieu may appear inaccessible. And at the, so there is a need to translate them for the current times. And at the other end, we have uh, what we typically call desecration. But then the question is, how true does one stay to the text? Because if I take the Ramayana, for example, and I uh, take Valmiki's Ramayana, which is the original, and then compare that with Tulsidas Ramayana, it is significantly different. But would I call that a desecration? I wouldn't. So, and if I look at uh, Kalidasa's Abhignana Shakuntala, which is based on the character of Shakuntala in uh, the in Vyasa's Mahabharata, it's diametrically opposite. The character is different, very, very different, right? So the question then for uh, writers is that to what extent do we stick to the original text? Because if I were to just reproduce the original text, then it is probably only a translation service. Maybe I'm retelling it in a simpler in simpler words, and one could even find uh, objections to that, saying that there are deeper hidden meanings which are not getting translated in that. But I think that is where, uh, at least so far as the Indian writing is concerned, the, uh, the uh, poetics, they have defined two things. One is what we call as Rasanubhava, or Rasa is basically the emotion that, uh, that a piece of literature or a piece of art, the emotion that it generates in the viewer or the reader. And they have identified uh, nine primary emotions. So what is the Rasa Anubhava that the reader is getting? And the second thing is that what is the objective of the writing? Of course, it uh, goes back to the four Purusharthas, the Dharma, Artha, Kama and Moksha. And so, so writing was supposed to be elevating. Now, obviously, that is a standard that we all aspire to. But I think if we go by some of those guidelines, it might help us. So it is not necessary in my view, I think, to be absolutely true to the original, because if we stay absolutely true to the original, we wouldn't have some of the brilliant pieces of literature that we have had in India, I mean, right from in the past 2000 to 3000 years. But the question also comes that, does somebody have a, a have a, a malefied intention? Uh, that again becomes very judgmental, so therefore I wouldn't go there. But yeah, I mean, that's my ramble and rant. So that's a good point, Ram. I think uh, sometime back when this topic was uh, discussed, or it, you know, in another setting it came up, I basically came up with, uh, with two points, which is that uh, I think reinterpreting, reimagining is the, is, is, you know, what every author writer has in terms of creative <laughs> liberty. When it comes to say a text like the Mahabharata, I think that there are two things that someone should ask whether they have 
the shraddha and whether they have the adhikar. So the shraddha is a sense of uh, respect and adhikar is, do you have the authority? Mm-hmm. And both are, are, are is something that I think in today's commercial context, I think um, uh, one or both are lacking. For example, it is very easy to take a character from the Ramayana or the Mahabharata and portray it as some sort of a modern feministic, uh, uh, you know, uh, uprising against traditional quote unquote patriarchal uh, standards of yesterday's society. And that is a theme that will resonate with a certain section. It will get, uh, you know, it'll get you eyeballs. It'll get you invited to lit fests. So it satisfies uh, one part of that author's commercial cravings as well as the uh, as as a feeling to be you know recognized as okay here is an iconoclast who is uh, who is coming out with a bold uh, reinterpretation of an epic, but is it that or is it like uh, you know the first time a, a a curse word was used in a movie, it 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 it, it was a big thing. And today, every movie has, uh, you know, a, a curse word being a four-letter word being used every four seconds. So, it essentially comes down to that. Do you do you is is that the path that that, you, that one wants to go? Again, people do take that path. There are very successful writers in India today who have chosen that path, become very successful by writing. You know, the essentially by by, yeah. So, so I, I, I don't question that, but I do say is that if I don't want to take that path, how do I, you know, as Ram said, that how do I do something more than just being a, a translator with some modern words thrown in? So that's, I think, the uh, fundamental dilemma. Um, I love for uh, Ram, you mentioned sort of, a, you know, there's kind of a list of what stories will do. I'd love for you to send that to me so I can see the words and, the, translation and the translations of those. But you sure. bring up authority. I think that, you know, that that authority is going back to me, what I would call authenticity, right? Authority is something you can just, I mean, I can, I can be authoritative and tell you this is how you write a story. I can do, I can make that up anyway. I think that that real authority comes from in my in my creative thinking from authenticity um the- exactly to to use a wicked example it's like yes you can talk about climate change and the environment but does someone like greta thunberg have the authority no in my mind <laughs> because it's not backed by authenticity and integrity well, well I- <laughs> goes without saying <laughs> but uh, I I I don't I, I I probably would try and stay away from castigating you know public figures you know I'm not sure that I would argue with her authenticity um, I I don't see her as being inauthentic um, but but I think you can make a point that she may not have the scientific the scientific authority um, but anyway I don't want to get into arguments like that but I think that this idea of authority I would I would try and lean you towards authenticity, like, right? Um, you know, like to me, like to go to go from the, you know, like an example from Western civilization would be like Martin Luther. Did he have the authority to confront the Catholic Church? But did he have authenticity? I think he did, right? I think that he had authenticity. He was a writer. He wrote his thing, and he nailed it to a door. I mean, that's pretty. That's a, a pretty authentic uh, expression of oneself, if you ask me, right? Um, and risking his life right. and risking his life to do it. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take authenticity in in uh, you know as uh, perhaps one of the three criteria because I think you're right. Authenticity is something that uh, eventually comes across. Uh, uh, you know, either its presence or its uh, lack of presence in the writing. So, I mean, short of all of this, it comes down to, is it a choice I want to make? And if I don't want to make that choice, then how do I 
put this writing in a form, in a manner that is, you know, uh, different in a good, entertaining, inform, informative, useful way. So, right. And, and, and I also think, I know Swetha, we, sorry, I, I know you had your question and I, I, want, I, I want to get to you just, um, the one thing, I would, one thing I would suggest for us as writers is for us to really not uh, beware of ad hominem attacks right, of others. What we want to do is we want to, if we might, we're, we're impassioned about something, we might feel that other writers are doing something that we consider wrong. But if they're, if they're successful, I think we should try and understand why it's, success, why it's successful. I think that that speaks to relevance, this issue that we can't get around. Our reader wants something that's relevant. What our reader decides to do is not wrong. How can it be wrong? It is the human impulse. So there's something right about it. We cannot, as a writer, we cannot berate, we're not preachers. We can't berate the person and tell them that they must listen to us. They won't. We don't have any power. We don't have any physical power over them. We have to work with the audience. And the audience is very much like ourselves. And the more we realize that, the better off we are. But rather than the ad hominem attack, these people are doing something wrong. Let's think about what we want to do. Turn the lamp, <laughs> I think of it as turn the lamp inward, right? Look at the self, look at your authenticity, right? Look at, look at the work you wanna do and think, I mean, grapple with yourself. This, this should be agony for us. Our writing is important, I know that. I know it's important for us. We would not do it. Just like Mamet says, we always do something to get what we want. Our, our writing is something that we are doing clearly and we are driven by passions to, to do it. So let's look carefully at that, understand what we want to do, and then understand also what the reader, our audience wants and needs from us too. We cannot ignore them, otherwise we're abusing them, right? Exactly, so you know, as far as the other authors go, who have chosen a certain path, I, my thoughts are that it's their choice. I uh, don't have any influence on that, nor do I want to get into that. Is it a choice I want to make? No. If they want to do, uh, do something, it's their you know, freedom to go ahead and do that, number one. So if I don't want to do that, but I still want the reader to engage, then yes, I think absolutely it uh, is something that I have to figure out is there something in the writing that has appealed to the reader? Some elements of the of the of their craft of writing. I'm not talking about uh, the distortions, misrepresentations, desecrations, etc. But is there something in their style of writing that I can uh, learn from? So the second part is the one that I am, uh, uh, you know, grappling with. What elements? What style? What narration? What point of view? What uh, uh, you know, where to have exposition, where to take some creative liberties and all. I think that's the part that I'm grappling with. Right. I, uh, Swetha, I was, I'm, I'm so sorry, but I just want to, I want to emphasize because we're really talking, because in some ways, like I'm trying, I want to work with sort of my, my expectations, you know, like, like, you know, I'm obviously trying to, to help you accomplish what you want to accomplish. And um, one of one of my premises is, you know, like I'm a good reader for you. I I don't I'm I'm not a believer. You know, I don't. You know, I'm not. In the same way, I'm not with the the Christian tradition either, or the Jewish tradition, or the Muslim tradition. I'm I'm not. I I see these as stories. I am trying to train you to write, to capture not your friends, not your family, but the people who don't think what you think, right? Like to use the techniques that say, you know what, you open this book and now you can't put it down. We can, we can always, we can, we can preach to the choir all we want. And, and a lot of people make a, uh, you know, they make their living doing that. 
it's great, I guess. But that's a closed cycle. That's not what I'm after doing. I'm not trying to do that. I want my I want my enemy to read my work. I want the person that says, God, I hate that uh, ostentatious, uh, vain Otis. I hate that guy. But damn it, I cannot put down his story. Exactly. Exactly. Not the first part, the second part, that I can't put down his story. <laughs> Swetha, what were you going to say? Sorry, I was interrupting you so much. Actually, I was thinking of the example of Canon Gate myth series, which had Peniplopoid, which Margaret Atwood had done, and Wait, which Jeanette Winterson had done. So they were good examples of retellings of an ancient tradition or an ancient traditional story. So Penelopoid was a retelling of uh, Odyssey. And, uh, <laughs> and yet uh, Margaret Atwood had been able to appeal to the modern uh, reader. And uh, similarly, as uh, I think Atlas's story was Wait. And also uh, Robert, uh, Roberto Colasso has done Ka, which is a retelling of uh, Indian uh, stories. I won't use the word mythology because I, I mean, I don't see it as my mythology. I see it as a reality. But uh, Indian stories, uh, Roberto Colasso had done a very good retelling. And uh, but, but the thing is, the question I had in my mind was that uh, for 4,000 years, we have preserved these texts as they are. And they are yogic texts. So uh, read, if I do Surya Namaskaram or if I read the Ramayana, it has the same effect. Today, I went to a bookshop and I saw a book called Kaikeyi. I obviously didn't want to pick it up. Now, Kaikeyi is one of the negative characters in uh, the Ramayana. And uh, this is for Otis's benefit. I mean, uh, uh, for the Indians, I think everybody knows about Kaikeyi. And... Um, uh, she she's one of the she's the wicked stepmother actually Ram's wicked stepmother. So there is a book uh, right now in uh, Waterstones which is um, say, uh, which is uh, very beautifully displayed saying Kaikei the story of the great queen and this and that and this sort of thing. I mean I I mean why do you want to put Kaikei's story? I mean uh, for four thousand years we are preserving these great yogi texts which have esoteric knowledge for the whole human race. And uh, if we if we at this stage disturb it because we have access to technology and writing has become easy for us, I mean I think it is going to be really sad. Mm -hmm. Well, I go I I personally am influenced by this idea of the oral storytelling tradition. Okay, there wasn't, so if writing goes back 5,000 years, the oral story tradition goes back, and I just make up my numbers as I go along, but let's say 100,000 years, okay? Let's say we've had 100,000 years of oral storytelling tradition. We only have 5,000 years maximum, and even then we, we understand that a lot of it was oral and, and et cetera, et cetera, of written tradition. This idea of the story is told, someone, there's a storyteller, there are people sitting around the fire, and that <laughs> storyteller makes the story relevant. Over 100,000 years, every time that story was told, it was relevant to the people that were listening to it. Was it always the same? I don't think so. There was no way to verify whether it was or wasn't. I use that, that, that principle has driven me to allow me to accept that I need to, you, we're talking about keeping stories alive. You know, you know, it's sort of like, I guess I go to, to my uh, Malcolm X quote, by any means necessary, right? We keep them alive by any means necessary. Um, the, I mean, you can argue in, in, uh, in Christian tradition, you know, we, we have, I mean, the, the, the story of Jesus, for example, who's victimized on the cross, that wasn't new, even when it was told about Jesus, right? That's an older story that got retold through the life of Jesus. That story then was retold ever since in the Western tradition. Right. Um, 
I mean, even the Iliad, in a sense, is a retelling of that, right? Uh, Ithaca is victimized by Troy, and then Ithaca goes to Troy and seeks retribution. That story is not new. It's retold. And it continues to be relevant for us in each retelling. I can, I mean, in terms of that, the, the Christian story in, in the Western tradition, we talk about in literature class, Christ figures. But why are we talking about Christ figures? They're not Christ figures necessarily. They are the story of someone is victimized and then there's some kind of retribution for that victimization. So these stories, the stories that we tell are, anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm ranting a little bit, but I think it's grapple with these issues. I mean, I, I say a lot in my, very sweeping terms, if our writing is easy, we're not doing it right. This should be difficult. It is difficult. It is very hard to do this work, to negotiate ourselves, our ego, what we want with this pesky audience who makes demands on us of relevance to their lives. That is very, very hard, but we have to do something that's going to be like this. This is my, my intellectualization of it in order to make my struggle easier. I don't get to tell people what to think. I have to give them something that's relevant that they want to hear. You probably noticed this. You can't make anyone even hear what you're saying. They interpret it for themselves. We have to deal with this issue. We have to deal with this idea that we're writing a bridge. Um, and I'm glad we're having this conversation. I'm also, and I think this is true of every writer, I have found, particularly now, I mean, I am a strategist. I am a strategist. I'll go back again to Tom Stoppard's Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. He wanted to write some, he wanted to make a play that was relevant to the audience. So he wrote about people who were like the audience, who were lost in a story that they did not understand. The entire time that the audience is there sitting in the theater, they're looking at Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. They're not looking at Hamlet. They're not looking at the king. I forget the king's name in this case. They're not looking at Laertes. They're not looking at Ophelia. All of these characters are off stage. They're looking at the people that they can identify with. Think about that. If you're going to write about the characters who are lofty and up here, do you want to bring them down to the level so that the reader can identify with them? Do you want to make them human? If you don't, if that's if that's you know a, a taboo and it's not something you want to do, then you have to really grapple with whether you're going to connect with your audience or not, if you want to connect in that way. Or maybe that's not your audience. You, you, you just want to you know, write to preach to the choir because you're not going to reach an audience member like me, who's not, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to treat these characters as sacrosanct. They just seem emotionally distant from my life and they don't seem relevant to my life. These are the things we have to grapple with, I think. I think it's, uh, I personally love the problem that we're, we're, we're talking about. And I, and I think probably the answer is for us to work together. If this is something that we want to strategize to do, I would love to work with you to figure out what those strategies are. Um, Brachu, we better talk about your piece quickly, but yep. a lot of this stuff is relevant to your piece too. But Brachu, so so in your piece, let me, let's go to that. Um, so like when Brachu, you don't really have this developed in this piece, but when he says we have Krishna at a TED talk, you suddenly see that's a this, this is becoming a kind of postmodern thing. But that is, um, 
joining right some of these things you know there's krishna who's you know the person of the text and a, a god who's lofty and and you know who's been known for thousands of years even before writing right and now you have the ted talk that's something that the modern audience understands and then you say you know krishna i'm sorry we couldn't have steve jobs here but we have krishna you know it's like yeah, yeah. you understand and it right steve jobs is a little bit like krishna to the modern audience right it's this you know or um right, you you know, or maybe it's like yeah, i'm story, sorry we couldn't gets, have yeah. steve jobs right yeah. so now you're now you're really you're you're mixing it up you know um that's that's interesting to me that's bringing it into the modern context um yeah, see this all this started like i think 7 years back uh, there was this 7 uh, 8 years so there was this uh, somebody had asked to make give a presentation on like is like something like mahabharat really useful and i said oh you have, we have a lot of project management lessons from mahabharat so this was one of that one that you know while you know running to kill jayadrath with sun setting and everything arjun takes a breather he spends time <laughs> and takes a breather refreshes and then launches again so this is a very and and again i gave the example of uh, um, general omar bradley you know the sicily when they ran through it and he suddenly asked patton and everybody to stop to breathe so that you know they were and and that basically broke the morale of the italian and the germans you why did they stop and then when they launched again they were able to push through so that's the idea that you know it's a project management lesson going through thousands of years and so that's why i i sort of put in that link or uh, statement also you know it something like bill gates or general omar bradley or his boss would understand eisenhower here yeah, right so 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 i had written it that but then later on uh, uh, i was writing this series of i it was part of that i you know so basically it's related to something which arjun already understood that you know it should not take your eye of the target everything should be always focused this everybody tells you this story of this arjun you know he was only focused on the eye but i said no in real real life he actually took the his eye of the target he took a breather so so that part came it and then you talked about you know omniscient narrator so then i converted it so it sort of it's this is like a uh, you know sort of in development in the mix this uh, article or oh, this sort of this story is as a part of that so it's it's part of the and again uh, so this yeah you're right it's a it's a biased narrator <laughs> the the narrator is the omniscient he is part of the story and he is biased he is biased towards arjun so that that part is there pranchi let's uh, yeah. have you read let, let's have you read this first page for us and then then we'll do a little more talking and then probably we'll have to we'll have to go but let's hear this first page uh i can do the second page i actually like that part can i start from the end of the first page and read it up you pranchu yeah what on earth okay where do you want me to start here our uh, second page no second page any other warrior any other warrior starting here yeah yeah so okay we Yeah, so already sort of stated the premise and what so any other warrior would have used his unparalleled and unbeatable arsenal of divine weapons to destroy the three views and return with Jadhav's head before Yudhishthir would have finished his first cup of tea in the morning or whatever he drank in the morning those days. I know I was there. <laughs> We drank curd water, chach. The curd water containers were put in the chariots of all warriors to continuously imbibe through the day. Oh. to control the acrid taste of adrenaline as the battles of the day wore on and sapped the strength and the resolve of warriors before bhim would have asked vishok to fetch another glass of lassi are anu kanu arjun would have be back and said ghana sulta diya i am done but kintu parantu no arjun did not use his divine weapons he had made the bet believing in his purusharth human enterprise and stuck to that belief he would fight this war as a human and not a semi semi divine son of king of gods and that he did so uh,
Great. Uh, yeah. Is that? Oh no, that's that's fine. That's wonderful. So hey, I like I like this line. Okay, the um, how do you say that human enterprise? Could you say that word again? Purushart. Purush, okay, so Purushart. That, for me, that that triggered that triggered in me, you know, like this. I guess I might as well be honest. I believe that I do believe that being a writer and being an artist of any kind of artist, I think that that is a little bit of a divine calling. Okay. And we have the divine calling to be a writer and we have the human enterprise of being a writer. <laughs> Creating so, so I think that that's, I think that it's relevant to our conversation here today that we need to keep in mind both of those things. We have the divine calling let's use that let's let's appreciate that in ourselves um and and even embrace it and then we have the human enterprise of writing which is difficult and temporal right and it's it's located in space and time and it deals with other concrete objects like ourselves the human enterprise so we have those two things i think that that might be useful for us as we think about our writing um so uh, in this piece, it is a little bit the same, except for we have this we have this frame that we have a person who's acting as a kind of storyteller. And, and so in the beginning of the story, I'm recognizing that there is an I, I was there, we drank curved water, right? So we have a narrator basically who has personality. They have personality because they're an I. In the modern story, Right. So th this is like. In the oral tradition, you would have a storyteller. The storyteller does not say I. Yeah. Right. Probably, you know, they they're just standing there and they tell the story. So that means then they're behaving as an omniscient person. Right. If they had personality and they said I was there, then they're then they're also both a narrator. Right. They're a storyteller and a character in the story, right? If they use the word I and they have that personality, then we also wonder why are they telling us this story, right? Because they're now a person with motivation. When they're omniscient, our omniscient narrator does not have this motivation we're talking about with character. It seems to me. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And that's and that's where that's where we go wrong a lot of the time because a lot of people write omniscient, right? But they actually do have a motive. They yeah. have something yeah. that they're trying to do. They're trying to convince you of their opinion and to dissuade you from your opinion. And to do that, we know in nonfiction, for example, they will do all sorts of things to try and trick you into believing what they have to say, including adopting a lot of authority. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So there's a lot of uh, what I would consider unethical ways that people can write and use omniscience. But when they have a first person in there, then we're actually announcing that we have motive. Like yeah. every other character on Earth, we are a human being and we have a motivation. Of course, we know sort of abstractly that the author is a human being and they have a motivation. But we absent that from the page when we write with omniscience. Uh, because you yeah. have a first person, because you have a first person here, I am sort of like, okay, why is this person telling me this story? What is the purpose? And it feels like for you, Branchu, that you're just making them this storyteller. That's like, and, and then right, they, and I yeah, and I, now I understand. So in the beginning, when I'm telling the premise, also why I should be telling the story, this management lesson. I so so there is this there was there's this part of the story that Krishna actually was willing to cheat to help Arjun that day. But Arjun didn't need that cheat. So so sort of Arjun surprised Krishna by actually changing the tone. He took the eye of the ball. So Krishna didn't need to do that cheat towards the end. Though in, in traditional Indian stories, we say that Krishna did cheat in the end and helped Arjun out because Krishna is the god. So he only he can do something which is there. But in actual Mahabharat, Arjun didn't need that help if Krishna had it planned. So so you're right. That motive should have been in the beginning as a part of the premise. And 
you know and i was willing to sort of you know cheat that day but you know this fellow surprised yeah. me and that's that's where the and and so that part uh, yeah that part should be there in the beginning of the story itself uh, okay. as a part of it well let me let me try and so we just try and find words to, to i want everyone to uh, you know work out your problems and come up with your solutions when we give ourselves problems to to solve that's when we write a tour de force but the other the other possibility is that we fail to solve the problem and we don't reach the reader when i look at this story i see a combination of a couple different forms like if we're talking about this history of literature i'm seeing a couple different things that are confusing to me it seems like it's old timey right like the storytelling tradition of thousands of years ago so it seems like the storyteller around the fire but it also seems like it's a modern story in a sense because i'm dealing with characters that i can identify with but then later on i find out that we talk about steve jobs and a couple other people it seems like a postmodern story so it seems like an ancient story <laughs> a modern story and a postmodern story and i'm being like you know <laughs> confusing, confusing you yeah <laughs> i for the most part you know in these in these classes i think that i'm really trying be, because i think it's a stage you know i think that as we're developing our writing craft and our understanding of writing the the first place to get to is basically an understanding of the modern story to be able to write the modern story um and then with even even the modern stories it moves into like the 50s and 60s the kind of emphasis on a a point of view character having a single point of view that kind of thing the literary short story that's sort of what i've been trying you know i use as a base i would hesitate to tell you pranchu to uh jump into the postmodern story for example to be writing about a ted talk but if you were but if you were to do it own it do it at the very beginning tell us you yeah, know yeah. um rosencrantz and guildenstern are dead is a good example of a postmodern story because what it, what a postmodern story does is it basically is self referential it understands that it is a story You're right and it's and an iteration of a story and so by by introducing the ted talk then it's a story about a ted talk which is a story right um it's complicated if you if you don't know the kind of structural forms i mean a lot of what i do right when i when i was talking to sweta you know and talking about sensory detail that's really talking about structural forms in the modern story that's how we engage a reader and engage their imaginative process that i would think is a modern technique we have to understand that modern technique before we write the postmodern story like i i feel you know it's like they say about picasso you know picasso could could paint something that was a trompe l'oeil he was classically trained he could do he could paint something that looked it was like oh this person is like he could do their portrait and it would look exactly like them he could do that before he did cubism not handling the 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 basics of point of view of sensory detail of dramatic construction right that that really aristotle was already working on aristotle knew how to write drama right and we have to know how to write drama if we don't know drama how can we write the postmodern story which is going to be dramatic it has to also be dramatic but then it's going to be doing more things um an example of a postmodern uh movie is uh Oh gosh. Uh being John Malkovich. 
Bingyan Malkovich. <laughs> yeah. Bing John Malkovich, for me, an amazing movie, but it's not, not dramatic because it's postmodern. It's dramatic and postmodern. So it's taking everything from the tradition that's good and works and then adding something more to it, making it more, more interesting and more relevant for the modern audience. Um, there was another one. What was being John Malkovich? What was the one about the Kaufmans, the scriptwriters, the Kaufmans, um, with the orchid, the orchid keeper, but they didn't call it that. It was it was writing the script about the orchid keeper. Or the no, sorry, the orchid thief. It was writing the script about the orchid thief, but then they ended up doing writing the script about the orchid thief. And oh, adaptation. There's another example of postmodern adaptation. Adaptation is not not dramatic. So, if you if you take, I I would hesitate to tell you to take on the, writing the postmodern story before you can handle the modern story. Right. And I'm going to tell you the modern story still works. There's nothing wrong with the modern story, just like there's nothing wrong with, you know, a dramatic play, just as there's nothing wrong with a with a movie. A movie is basically the movies that we watch for the most part are modern stories. They're simple stories about protagonists versus antagonists that start at the beginning and go to the end. Then we do have examples in movies of postmodern movies like adaptation and being John Malkovich. Um, so if you want to do it, Pranchu, it is a way to, to bring this story. You know, uh, Krishna can come in to a TED Talk and he can be saying, you know, he'd be like, a lot of people thinking think that cheating is wrong. But yeah, and that, that's actually, and, and that 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 right. was the thing behind it. Yeah, the next right. the next story right. so, on that. And then he's like, that, yeah. <laughs> right, or like you're saying, you're like Krishna comes out and he says, you know what, modern, you know, modern management styles need the Mahabharata to, let, you know, like it can be it can be structured like a TED talk, but if you do that, Pranshu, then you need to structure it like a TED talk. Yeah, TED right. talks. Right. TED Talks actually draw upon dramatic principles in order to be effective for audiences. Right. I've heard, but I don't know, I don't know a lot about TED Talks, but I've heard that they give very specific directions to their speakers about how to organize their TED Talks. And they do that because the form of the talk makes it interesting for the listener. And even then, still a lot of people do not look at TED Talks. They would rather look at Liam Neeson do whatever Liam Neeson does once again, right? But some people do, and they have a strict format. If I were doing a postmodern story about Krishna doing a TED Talk, I would have Krishna, you know, walk out there and say, TED Talk has told me to structure my essay in this way. I will tell you that I've been structuring essays in this way for thousands of years millennia before the beginning of time right right that's right. how krishna would you know krishna's like this is not new and, and that's why I, that's why i'm writing this not I new, want to my put friends in, yeah right I mean, yeah i didn't want to put in like self-doubt or something he's still the omniscient guy he so so yeah. that's why i was like saying that the drama drama was not coming through his voice because i mean i've done this this is i'm it's doable like, see, so that, that drama was not coming through that much. So I was focusing more on, like, you know, other aspects around it. Right, right. The storytelling, the idea of storytelling, the idea of authenticity, the idea of relevance to the audience, these things have existed for thousands of years, is the point that I kind of want to make. When the stories were in that sort of ancient form, they were relevant to the ancient audience. When they were in the modern form, they were relevant to the modern audience. When they're in the postmodern form, they're relevant to the postmodern audience. The audience changes, the story changes, but the principles remain exactly the same. 
So decide what you want to do and stick to that and yeah. do it with those principles. But I think that I think the principles of authenticity and relevance are very, very good guides for us. All right, intense conversation, my friends. Any questions? This was, this was definitely very <laughs> engaging, a lot more engaging than our, our than than our typical sessions. But I think uh, that's then. But this is kind of part of the reason uh, why we have these workshop sessions. That uh, it's not just a. This is not an exercise in submitting homework and uh, you know the the class teacher correcting them and assigning a grade. This is about uh, asking genuine fundamental doubts about the craft of writing, the motivation of writing, and seeing if uh, some some answers or some hints uh, to answers come up. So I think to that end, this is great. Of course, I mean, uh, you know, lots of thanks to everyone who, you know, who stuck around because uh, not everyone at all points in time will be engaged in a particular discussion that's going on. But I think uh, to the end, it helps answer these fundamental questions. It's, uh, it's great. And, and, and I want to say for myself, I, I am really, truly, a, I am a believer in your stories. I mean, they, they, are, they are fantastic. And I, and I want to really help you as best I can, you know, bring them to the audience that, that deserves them. You know, I mean, I think it's, I think it's a fantastic project. I mean, I... For me, I, I I'm so thankful for my 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 exposure to your stories. You know, I mean, I've I've been ensconced, I've been ensconced, as you know, in a Western tradition, which then becomes an American tradition, which then becomes even more annoyingly a Hollywood tradition, and all the time it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. Okay, and so I uh, I I. I feel thankful and and even blessed. I don't use that word very often. That that you're including me in this, you know, project. So thank oh, you. Thank you, thank you, Otis, for those kind words. And again, I think the more people that take advantage of this uh, service provided by Indica, I think the great, the better. But uh, uh, folks, thank you for joining and uh, do send in your stories. I know this is the start of the new year, so it takes time to again, you know get that uh, that writing impulse cranked up, but uh, please do. And we'll put this video up on YouTube in a couple of days and I'll uh, share that link out. Thank you, good night and good day everyone.